let's discuss operations with functions. In the first section in our notes, 1 through 4 is intended to be a review. Do you remember how to add or subtract polynomials? Try these out on your own. Similarly with 5, 6, and 7, multiplying the expressions. We're working with polynomials. This is likely something that you've done in Algebra 1 or previous math class. So try it on your own and see if you can get the answers. You can always go back and look at the OneNote for those answers after the video. These expressions could represent functions. We could think of, instead of the polynomial 5x minus 7 and the polynomial 8x plus 11, we can think of them as the function f of x, which is 5x plus minus 7, or g of x, which is the function 8x plus 11. If we add them, we can add functions just like we were adding polynomials above. So we can perform operations of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division with functions just as we do with numbers and with algebraic expressions. There is some special notation that we'll use for functions to indicate these operations. One important feature that we need to know is that the domains of the new functions depend on the domains of the functions they were constructed from. The domain of the resultant function consists of all of the values in the domains of both f and g, except for division, where we have to remove any x values that make the g function equal to zero. Whatever we're dividing by, we can never divide by zero. Here we have some simplified notation. If we're adding two functions together, we add them together. It may seem a little silly, this redundancy, but the first the first notation is the name of the function, and the second part is how we get it, okay? And so hopefully that will help clear some things out. One little mistake I need to correct on mine, this is f of x times g of x. For some reason the PDF didn't convert my dot into a dot. It made it a rectangle. Not sure why. And so we have addition, f plus g of x is f of x plus g of x. x must be in the domain of both f and g. Same with subtraction, we subtract the functions. x is in the domain of both. Multiplications, we multipl multiply the functions. F and, um, x is in the domain of f and g. And in the division, if we divide, we just need to make sure that our denominator cannot be zero. So we throw out the values of x that make g equal to zero. We can look at these operations numerically or symbolically. We'll start out numerically. And we'll do an addition, a subtraction, a multiplication, and a division. And I'll leave the others for you to practice. In the first one, f plus g of 3, using the notation above, f of x plus g of x would be how we would separate f plus g. But I don't have x, I have 3. So I'm going to put in 3 where the x was. Why is this so great? Well, f of 3 I know is 7, and g of 3 I know is negative 2. So I can replace f of 3 with 7 and g of 3 with negative 2 and I get the answer 5 when I add them. So f plus g of 3 is 5. Let's take a look at number 11. f minus g of negative 2. We can write it out like we did 
for the addition, the same idea here, f of x, but x is negative 2, minus g of x, but x is negative 2. And then noticing f of negative 2 is 4, and g of negative 2 is 0. I can replace f of negative 2 with 4, and g of negative 2 is 0. Subtract them, 4 minus 0 is 4, so I know f minus g of negative 2 is 4. Looking at multiplication, I'm going to change the problems I had selected before. We'll do 12 and 15. Multiplication, the same idea, f times x, g times, uh, change that, that was wrong. f of x times g of x. And we can put in the threes, because we have threes. I'm going back to my colors, f of three is seven g of 3 is negative 2, and so I substitute the numbers in for the function notation, f of 3 is 7, g of 3 is negative 2, multiply them together, we get negative 14. And then in our division, f divided by g of negative 2, f of negative 2 divided by g of negative 2, f of negative 2 is 4, g of negative 2 is 0, we can plug in those numbers, 4 over 0, uh-oh, I'm dividing by 0, I can't, this is undefined. When you try 13, 13 will work out, no big deal. Throwing up a couple of answers up here, this is negative 7 halves, This is 9. This is 4. And f of g. And this is last one, 14 is 0. So just some numbers up there to help you check your own work. But work it out top to bottom. Show all your work, show your operations so that you understand why these numbers are coming out the way that they are. And there you have numerically. Using the functions to find the following now, instead of having just single function values given, we have a function that we can use to find the outputs. There are two ways we can approach these problems. We can either take the input and put it into both of the output, put it into both of the functions and get outputs, and then add the outputs. Or we can first find f plus g of x, and then from that plug in the three. Either way is acceptable, both ways work. Let's show both with number 16, f plus g of 3. So this is equal to f of 3 plus g of 3. So we will first find f of 3, 3 minus 3, 3 minus x, 3 minus 3 is 0. And so then we find g of 3, x squared plus 1, and I put in a 3, 3 squared plus 1, 9 plus 1 is 10. And these pieces that we just did are more of an off to the side thing because now we put them into our expression to simplify. So f of 3 is 0, g of 3 is 10, 0 plus 10 is 10, and that would be my answer to f plus g of 3. Doing it the other way, instead of plugging in 3 each time, 
and then simplifying, for f plus g of x, we will treat the functions just like the polynomials we were doing in the review part above. f of x is 3 minus x. g of x is x squared plus 1. Since I have a plus sign, I can drop all of the parentheses. And then simplify. x squared minus x plus 4. This is my expression for f plus g of x, meaning if I have an x value that I want an output for, I can just plug it in. And that's exactly what we're going to do. f plus g of 3 equals x squared minus x plus 4. But now I put in the 3. And we can simplify. 3 squared is 9 minus 3 plus 4. 9 minus 3 is 6. 6 plus 4 is 10. Exactly the same answer that we got doing the other method. And that is intentional. It should be the same answer. We're doing correct mathematical things. We're just using different procedures. But since both procedures are correct and essentially equivalent, in the first one we're plugging in the input into each individual function and simplifying. And in the second part, we're first simplifying the function addition and then plugging in the number. It works out. Let's do the multiplication. f times g of 0. f of 0 times g of 0. In doing this, f of 0, 3 minus 0 would give us 3. g of 0, 0 squared plus 1 would be 1. And if we multiply them together, 3 times 1 gives us 3. Try the subtraction in number 17 and the division in number 19 on your own and see if you can come up with the answers that will be in the OneNote. Moving on to numbers 20 and further, notice in these cases we just have x. So for these problems, we're going to first find the function that is the answer to these operations and also the domain of that function. So let me rewrite our functions up here in the corner. f of x was 3 minus x and g of x was x squared plus 1. Do you recall what kind of function 3 minus x is. 3 minus x is linear. y equals mx plus b. m would be negative 1 and b would be 3. The highest power on x is 1. For g of x, g of x with that x squared there, g of x is a member of the quadratic family. But both of these are subfamilies in the much larger family of polynomials, or the much larger, broader class of function known as polynomials. Polynomials are special because all polynomials have the same domain. The domain of our polynomial functions, all polynomial functions, 
is all real numbers. So the domain of our polynomial functions, all polynomial functions, is all real numbers. This is convenient because now our addition, subtraction, and multiplication will also have those domains. The domain of the resultant function will be where the functions overlap or what they have in common, but they have everything in common. So our domains are the same for all three of those functions. Um, not quite for our division. We've got to check our division, which we'll do in a minute. Number 20, we actually already did in that problem above. f plus g of x is x squared minus x plus 4. We did that above. So I won't recreate that problem for you. Taking a look at the subtraction, though, this is good to see. f of x minus g of x. Let's plug in our functions. f is 3 minus x. g is x squared plus 1. You do need to be very mindful of that subtraction sign because the subtraction pertains to the entire g function, which means we need to distribute before we can let those parentheses go. So we distribute 3 minus x minus x squared minus 1. And we simplify negative x squared minus x plus 2. 3 minus 1 is 2. And that is our resultant from the subtraction. Multiplying f of x times g of x. 3 minus x times x squared plus 1. You can FOIL this because it is two binomials. Or I like to use the box method because it always works no matter how many terms you have. 3 minus x, x squared plus 1. I write my terms around the box. And then inside the box goes each product of what's on the sides. So 3 times x squared x squared times negative x, 3 times 1, and then 1 times negative x. And then I write everything inside the box, 3x squared minus x to the third. I'm actually going to start with my highest power, minus x to the third plus 3x squared minus x plus 3. That is my f times g of x function. And looking at the division, I do want to add one more problem. I want to look at g divided by f of x because we're going to see some interesting things happen. f divided by g, we write that out. 3 minus x over x squared plus 1. We cannot simplify anything. We can't factor anything out and cancel. And we leave it. The next step is to check or to see if there are any x values that would make the denominator 0. So we try. Subtract 1. x squared equals negative 1. Um, this one, I don't know any x values that would multiply to give me negative 1 because if I take two positive numbers and multiply them, I get a positive answer. If I take two negative numbers together, I get a negative answer. And remember, for x squared, I have to take the same number twice. So a positive number times itself would give me a positive answer. A negative answer times itself would give me a positive answer. Negative times a negative is a positive. There are no values of x that would solve this equation. So we have no values of x that would give us a zero in our denominator. That's a good thing in the sense that this means our domain is still all real numbers. Everything's okay for this one. 
So the reason I'm adding another problem is because things don't work out so nicely when we switch it around. So let's try switching it around. G on top, F on the bottom, X squared plus one over three minus X. Now we need to check three minus X, three minus X equals zero, X equals three. I must remove this from my domain. Because it makes my denominator equal to zero, it causes the rational expression to be undefined, and I cannot have undefined as an output for a function. Doesn't work. So our domain here, will be negative infinity. I'm, I'm gonna draw a graph first before I do the interval notation. Here's three, but I throw it out. Everything else is okay. I could say it in words, all real numbers, except three. And then if I write interval notation, Negative infinity is the left pointing arrow, positive infinity is the right pointing arrow, but I'm leaving a giant hole on three. So I'm going to go from negative infinity to three, but I don't include three, I have to throw it out. And then I pick back up on just on the other side of three, three, two, infinity, Union symbol in the middle, meaning we need both of these pieces of the interval to comprise the entire domain. And that concludes our initial discussion on operations with functions. We'll be looking at these operations a little bit more and picking up one more operation in a few chapters from now.